This is a non-profit audio drama based on a fan fiction of Danganronpa V3 Killing Harmony. Danganronpa is owned by Spike Chunsoft and Kazutaka Kudaka. Previously on Three Point Shot. You didn't do it. I was gonna tell you to do whatever it took to solve the case. I feel like I can trust you, Kaede. How? After what I did? I want to find the truth, and I can't do it alone. Will you help me? What was the purpose of Shuichi's demonstration with the shot put along the row of bookcases? It leads from the open vent down to where we found Rontaro's body. Man, the only two people in that room were- I threw it! You what?! Atua didn't tell me about this! I tried to kill the Mastermind. Now Rantaro's dead instead. Shuichi already proved it wasn't you. So you've got nothing to feel guilty about. What evidence do we still have? We need to gather alibis for that time. Now that you have a time frame for the crime, someone's alibi doesn't hold up anymore. This is insane! Kaede lives in Jolip and it's two miles wide, and we're gonna believe she's innocent? Sumugi Shirogane, you're the real murderer! It's not supposed to be me! It's supposed to be you! It's punishment time! <laughs> Even if she was evil and stuff, no one deserves to die like that! This is best. We should get along. Was Shimuki really not the mastermind? Why don't you figure it out for yourselves? I'll face whatever cruel truth awaits me head on. Anyone else? Aye. 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 Motion carries. Prepare the videos. Alex Redgrave presents, featuring the talent from Casting Call Club, Three Point Shot, based on the fan fiction by Random Rex Six, narrated, directed, and produced by Alex Redgrave. Part Two. Kaede was uncertain as to how she had returned to the class trial room, but she was far more concerned as to the image displayed on the view screen. Her face and the word guilty. No. What? But I didn't. Kaede. Her head turned sharply and met a horrifying sight. Rantaro was back, blood seeping from the fresh wound on the back of his head. By all accounts, he should have been slumped over dead. And yet, there he was. Why did you kill me? I thought we were friends. No! The pianist protested. It, it was Samuki! We proved! Again, Kaede turned to see her deceased classmate. But unlike Rantaro, Sumugi seemed none the worse for wear. In fact, there was no indication that she was anything like the madwoman from a few hours ago. What did I ever do to you? Why do you hate me? You're the one who threw the ball. This death is your fault! The other students joined in this chant. Your fault. Your, your fault. fault. Your fault, your fault, your fault, your fault. The metal collar that had snapped around Samugi's neck suddenly found itself around Kaede, as she was dragged away in a similar manner. Kaede found herself bound to a thin string, with a series of matching strings running parallel to the one she was on. A large blunt object struck a nearby string. Sound emanated from it, and it became all too clear what was happening. These strings were part of what must be a very large piano. As more and more hammers struck nearby strings, Kaede recognized the tune as Mozart's Requiem. A 
tad cliché, perhaps. But the captive girl quickly surmised which key she was on, and realized that though it wasn't one that would be hit during this piece, one wrong note would spell her doom. As the unseen performer continued to hit wrong notes, Kaede grew more and more nervous as to when her end would come. The roof above her head lifted, and Kaede saw the large form of who was playing the piano. Shuichi? The detective was now gigantic, but more noteworthy was his left eye, painted to resemble Monokuma's jagged red eye. Why did you lie to me? I... I didn't mean to. His hand came down on a single key. The hammer above Kaede swung down. Kaede catapulted out of bed in a cold sweat. She clutched her shoulders and shuddered in horror at the nightmare she had been through. As she took in her surroundings, she realized that Tragically, the part where she was still trapped in the ultimate academy of gifted juveniles was very real. She had trouble returning to sleep that night. The most notable thing about the next morning was the strange air that overtook the school. Unease had captured the hearts of the students. Though the trial had ended, no one could really say they were satisfied with the conclusion. The loss of two members of the group, regardless of the content of their character, was jarring to say the least. Kaede brushed past this air of depression, summoned her bold face, and took charge at the morning breakfast meeting. All right, is everyone here yet? A cursory glance around the room made the answer all too clear. We're missing two people, Kaede noted. Shuichi and Maki? Maki wishes to be left to her own devices, I'm afraid. Kirumi explained as she set the table. Kirumi, you really don't have to do all the work. Kaede offered. It's fine. It relaxes me knowing I'm being of service to others. The maid reassured. Okay. Where is Shuichi? The door of the cafeteria swung open somewhat haphazardly as Shuichi staggered in and promptly collapsed to the ground. Shuichi! The group rushed over to the now hatless boy, who was groaning in pain. Kaito was the first to offer comfort. Shuichi! You okay, man? The detective's eyes fluttered open as he pointed to the astronaut. You... you did this. Did what? Kaede asked. <laughs> Kaito scoffed. You're always being overdramatic. All I did was invite him to work out with me last night. My muscles are still sore, you monster. Shuichi cracked. Eh, you'll get used to it, Shuichi. I don't really plan on it, Kaito. So... Kaede inquired. Are you guys friends now, or...? <laughs> yeah, we are! Kaito replied, giving a thumbs up. This guy's pretty cool. He just needs a little toughening up. Someone put me in a chair, please. Shuichi requested. Gonta, being a gentleman, was more than happy to assist. Okay, now that we have Shuichi, let's get back on point. Kaede said, taking control of the conversation again. She was then interrupted by one of the others raising their hands. Ooh, ooh, I have a question! She sighed. Uh, yes, Kokichi? Why are you suddenly in charge? Kokichi asked. A surprisingly pointed question. Kaede kind of glanced at the others. Um, I guess I just... Just what? Kokichi countered. Just thought we'd forget about the fact that you lied to us and tried to kill someone. I don't know about you, but that's not a quality I look for in a leader. Of course. I am in the market for a new minion, if you're interested in that. Kokichi's question cut Kaede to her core. <laughs> The image of her classmates telling her what happened was her fault reared its ugly head yet again. Look, I'll settle this. Kaito offered, standing up. Anyone opposed to Kaede as leader, raise your hand. Kokichi's hand went up, but the only one supporting his campaign seemed to be new. Rephrasing to be safe. Kaito added. 
Anyone who thinks Kokichi would be a better choice, raise their hand. This time, Kokichi stood alone. Well, that takes care of that. Kaito observed, sitting back down. Kokichi began to tear up again. You really think she'd be better than me? Have I failed as the ultimate supreme leader? <laughs> and yet again, he composed himself almost immediately. Oh, wishes are vicious. The touching display, or lack thereof, gave Kaede hope that her nightmare wouldn't come to pass. With that, she resumed. Okay, first of all, thank you for your support. Kind of needed it after last night, but there's still a couple things we need to address. First, we need to run a search of that girl's bathroom, which should we to lead. Tenko has volunteered to supervise. Do we have any other volunteers? Shuichi merely groaned in response. Okay, seriously, Kaito, what did you make him do? Kaede asked. Just some push-ups and sit-ups. Nothing heavy. Kaito defended. He said he could handle it. I was wrong. Kaede gave a groan of her own. Oh, I guess we're postponing that. Any other business? The siren cry of the monocubs, now noticeably lacking in the color red, signaled their unexpected appearance in the cafeteria. It just isn't the same anymore without Monotaro. Monophony cried. Who will lead us now? Weren't you paying attention? Monokid responded. I'm in charge now. Who is that, Monokid? Monoske wondered. Now for the red guy, the blue guy's in charge. Everybody knows that. Right, Monodem? We should get along. Hell yeah! Monodem's finally speaking my language. And I love it. Kaede stole back attention with... What do you guys want? Well, since you completed your first class trial, you deserve a reward or something, right? Monosuke explained. And we got the best gifts money can buy! Monokie cheered. The cubs then presented a strange assortment of objects to the group. A red ball, a turn crank, an ocarina, and a locker tag. We can use these in just the right places. You can open up fun new locations all over the school. Monophony offered. You should get started. So long, farewell! And the cubs once again vanished. Well, what are we supposed to do with these things? Mew asked. You heard him, Ryoma replied. Let's start looking. Kaede again took point. There are four items, so we should split up into teams of three. That way there's one person left over, so Shuichi can rest up for a while. Thank you, the detective muttered. As the groups were decided, more or less at random, they split up and began to search the school. Team 1 had discovered that behind one of the school's locked gates, there were two large buildings, one of which was a casino that two of the students had taken to exploring. This place is huge! Kaede declared. Quite so, if a bit too flashy for my tastes. Karekio added. The casino operated with a system of game tokens that could be redeemed for an assortment of prizes. None of the prizes seemed all that impressive, and there certainly wasn't anything that could help the group escape, but the entertainment value held within was certainly appealing. At least we never have to worry about getting bored, Kaede observed. Perhaps, though games of chance have led more than one man to ruin in the past, Kurekio said, apparently in recollection. Speaking from experience? Kaede wondered. Heavens no, the anthropologist replied. I merely wish to avoid anything untimely happening to someone. The masked boy turned and noticed something interesting in the main hall of the casino. Ah, it seems you've hit the proverbial jackpot, my dear. The blonde turned to follow his gaze. Wow! It was a gorgeous piano, colored gold to match the bright atmosphere of the building. 
Kaede rushed over and sat in front of the instrument, her hands hovering over the keys. Oh, will I be so privileged as to receive a private concert? Karekio wondered. Kaede shook her head. No, actually, you've given me a great idea. We could have a big casino night. We'd all hang out together, we could get dressed up. Wait, no, we don't have any formal wear. I'm sure we could think of something. Karekio reassured her. Thanks, Kyo. Kaede smiled. You know, once you get past the creepy vibe you give off, you're actually a pretty nice guy. Karekio took a small bow in jest. I thank you for your compliments, my dear. I enjoy your company as well. You oft remind me of my sister. You have a sister? Kaede asked. Yes. I hope I could introduce you to her someday. The pianist smiled. That sounds nice. Forgive me for intruding. The third member of their team, Kibo, appeared before them. Oh, hey. How'd your search of the other building go? Kaede asked. I'm afraid the door was locked. Kibo explained. But the sign outside leads me to believe it is something called a love hotel. The two human students' eyes widened in shock. I'm afraid no information on such a facility exists in my memory. Could one of you explain it to me? Kibo requested, blissfully unaware. The two other ultimates glanced at one another, somewhat uncomfortable with this turn of events. Kaede then quickly called. Not it! Team 2 found a new building to the side of the gym. Said building contained a fairly large indoor pool, though it appeared to not have much water within. Man, so much regular laps. Kaito lamented. I think it's just about perfect. The artist replied. The work is perfect for a few special spiritual techniques I wanted to try. Haven't gotten the chance since I moved from my home island. Yeah, not exactly a steady transition, huh? Kaito offered. He had never really moved that much as a kid, but he knew from what he'd heard from others that it was never easy. All that matters is that Atoa is with me no matter where I go. Angie said, closing her eyes as if in prayer. That way, I know that I can find peace and happiness in all that. Kaito shrugged. Whoever does it for you, I guess. Apparently, we're not allowed to swim at night. The third member, Ryoma, commented. For real? Angie asked. Ryoma pointed to a list of pool regulations. Night swims are some of the best! I feel ya! Kaito commented. Of course, anything's better when there's stars in the sky, if you ask me. Ryoma, for his part, merely looked at the pool, somewhat da. Something wrong? Kaito asked. Swimming has never really been an option for me, Ryoma admitted. Realization dawned for the taller boy. Oh, right! <laughs> Because you've been in jail for so long. I was actually referring to my height. But thank you for reminding me of that. Ryoma deadpanned. No worries, Ryoma. And he cheered. I can totally teach you how to swim. I used to teach kids back home all the time. Don't bother. The ex-tennis pro replied. I don't really care. Oh, come on, Ryoma. Don't be like that. Atu is always there to make sure we all experience the funnest parts of life. Angie cheered. Huh, Ryoma chuckled. If there is a god, I doubt he cares about me anymore. The short boy simply walked away after that. I'll give him this. Kaito acknowledged. I can make an exit. What's he talking about? There's definitely a god, right Kaito? Angie protested. Eh, I'll believe it when I see it, was the astronaut's answer. Everyone here but me is so weird. Team 3 had stumbled upon two more research labs, and by a stroke of good fortune, had brought the two girls who were offered their heaven on earth with them. Himiko's research lab was filled to the brim with magic paraphernalia for every kind of siege trick imaginable. She'd protest that her work wasn't tricks, but real magic, though seemed very appreciative of the new supplies anyway. And yet, even her excitement over what was made available was surpassed by Tenko's. Oh, I am so happy to get to see Himiko in her element. Tenko cheered. Do you think your magic will be fully recharged soon? Well, 
Himiko pondered. I didn't really get much sleep last night because of the trial. Maybe in a few days? I'll wait however long you need. Maybe I could be your lovely assistant. I'm not a magician. I'm a mage. Himiko scolded. Oh, of course. I don't know what I was thinking. Himiko's lovely enough on her own anyway. Tenko sheepishly replied. You keep saying stuff like that. Do you play for the other team or something? Himiko asked. Tenko's eyes bulged. Uh, let's check on Kirumi. She advised, pushing Himiko out of the room in the process. When the two arrived in Kirumi's room, they were in awe of the Victorian era decor. The lab was like an old English dining hall, though off to the side were a wall of washing machines and an array of vacuum cleaners of various makes and models. Wow! The two new visitors announced. Kirumi walked out of the nearby closet and declared, Yes. This will certainly make all my work much easier. I will be more than capable of cleaning spills with these materials. And we may begin communal laundry, for simplicity's sake. I don't want my clothes mixed in with the degenerate males! The Aikido master demanded. The very thought of that! That is fine. We can have separate washes for the men and the women. Kirumi assured. Himiko yawned. Besides Queen? I cook, the maid protested. And what else? Himiko asked. I prepare for the next task, Kirumi replied, somewhat confused. What else would you like me to do? What do you do for fun? Himiko clarified. To me, my work is fun, Kirumi explained. There's nothing more satisfying than a job well done. That sounds awful, Himiko muttered. Tenko squealed. Himiko is so considerate. That just makes her cuter. Seriously, are you gay or not? Himiko questioned. Tenko quite noticeably didn't answer. Kokichi cursed his poor luck at being assigned to Team 4. Gonta wasn't a problem most of the time, but now he was in his recently found research lab. The room was basically one large insect terrarium, with a tree in the middle that had beehives hanging off of it. These poor bugs, Gonta lamented. Until Gonta got here, there probably wasn't anybody to feed them. But it's okay now. Gonta will keep them safe. Good day here, Kokichi offered. I'll go check on you. Have fun! I'll do my level best. Once he had finally vacated the room, he shuddered. Kokichi would hardly consider himself afraid of bugs, per se. Rather, he considered himself merely averse to their presence. And this was a nail in the coffin for his previous plan. Gonta wasn't that bright, but he was by far the most physically capable member of the group. These two traits made him an ideal minion in Kokichi's mind. But now that he had his lab, now that he'd been taking care of those disgusting creepy crawlies 24-7, mark him down as a maybe and move on. As he made his way down the hall, he noted a strange door done up in 8-bit style but locked. Nearby, he saw Mew next to what appeared to be a treasure chest. Any luck? Kokichi asked. The inventor scoffed. Sorry, liar boy, but we got gypped. This box is as empty as a virgin's asshole. Hmm. I wonder what used to be in it. Kokichi mused. Something big and heavy, I bet. Mew guessed. Oh, and I found the midget's lab. Which one? Kokichi asked. The tennis midget. Mew clarified. Damn, we got a lot of shorties around here, don't we? Indeed. The dictator wondered. I'm guessing it's basically an indoor tennis court? Yep. Hey, do you think it's proportional? Mew asked, apropos of nothing. Kokichi was briefly taken aback. By it, do you mean... Heck yeah! But you gotta figure with a voice like that, his balls must be huge! And I don't mean the green fuzzy ones. Or do I? Mew raised an eyebrow on that last statement. Kokichi backed away slowly. 
not sure. But if you find anything out about Keyboy, let me know. My interest was Pete. As Kokichi walked away, he heard Mew call back. Robosexual, huh? No shame in it. You've all had that face. Mew's technical know-how was useful, but her personality was far too abrasive for Kokichi to bear. Definite no on the minion front. As Kokichi wandered aimlessly in his attempt to escape, he found himself in front of an ornate red door trimmed with gold. He reached his hand to the knob, only for the door to open a crack and an occupant to peer out. What are you doing? Maki asked, pointedly. Oh, we were exploring! Is this your lab? Kokichi tried to peer his head around Maki, who had made a point of blocking his view into the room. Yes, and I don't want anyone in here but me. Got it. Maki's gaze narrowed. Come on, come on, just a peek! Kokichi pleaded. I won't tell, I promise! Your word means as much as a three dollar bill. Maki reminded him. If I catch you anywhere near my lab again, you will wake up very confused as to why your arms are attached to the wrong sides. She then slammed the door in Kokichi's face. Hmm. Kokichi muttered. Intimidating, intelligent, capable of keeping a secret, and not afraid of what anyone thinks of her? Perfect. With the exploration of the new areas complete, the 12 students reconvened in the cafeteria, with the now well-rested Shuichi joining them. All right. Kaede declared. I'll start us off. My team discovered two new facilities. The one's locked up, but the other is a fully functioning casino. And I thought that maybe we could organize some kind of casino night thing to get everyone's spirits up. There'd be food and gaming, and I could play piano. What do you say? General signs of approval worked their way through the group. I think we should also have Himiko do a magic cell. The Aikido master requested. Well... Kaede pondered. It would fit the casino motif, if she's up for it. Not until after tomorrow night. Himiko protested. By then, my magic should be back to normal. Kaede nodded. Sounds good. And we can spend tomorrow getting all the particulars in order. Anything else? What is this other facility you mentioned? Kirumi asked. As Kaede blushed, Kibo stepped in to answer. It was something called a love hotel. Neither Kaede nor Kyo were able to tell me what it is. <laughs> Mew exploded. <laughs> Sounds about right. Tell you what, I'll let you know sometime. What I want if you catch my drift. Thank you, Mew. That would be very helpful. Kibo replied obliviously. Mew quickly retreated into herself. Wait! Really? Someone please change the subject? Kaede pleaded. Kirumi, faithful servant she was, stepped in on cue. Our group successfully uncovered both my and Himiko's research labs. Furthermore, I am able to begin communal laundry. Hey, you don't have to do that. Kaito protested. We can all... Hush. Kokichi countered. If she wants to, let her. It is as Kokichi says. I do not mind. Kirumi reassured. Well, whatever. Kaito mumbled. Our group got shit. There's a pool and everything, but it's barely full and we're not allowed to use it at night. There's also a changing room right there in the building, which is great for switching into swimwear. Angie cheered. Aren't you always in swimwear? Kimiko questioned. And then there's my group. Kokichi interjected. We found some crazy stuff. Gonta found his research lab. And it's full of plenty of insect friends for Gonta. The gentle judge proclaimed. The group considerably kept their disgust to a minimum. Miu found Ryoma's lab, which is basically a tennis court. Oh, sweet! Was the reply from, of all people, Kaito. I'm a little rusty, but maybe you and me could play a set, Ryoma? The ex-champion scoffed. Why bother? Tennis doesn't really mean anything to me anymore. You're just saying that because you've been out of the game too long. One set, it won't kill you. The smaller boy's eyes narrowed. 
I'm not the one whose life would be at stake. Uh, yeah. Kaito wisely reneged on his offer. Kokichi resumed his explanation. After that, I ran into Maki in her lab, which she wouldn't let me see. I am curious as to what one might find in an ultimate child caregiver's lab. Korekia wondered. Psh, Mew scoffed. Probably a bunch of some nabby pampy kindergarten shit that would kill her I'm so mysterious thing she's got going. But the really weird part was this empty treasure chest just sitting in the hall. Kokichi finished. No clue what was supposed to be in it. I might know something! The group's heads turned immediately to meet the visage of Monokuma, chuckling to himself. <laughs> Back when Samugi had a say in things, she wanted to give you all a little gift if you made it past the first trial. But the way I see it, just knowing that there is hidden treasure is a gift in and of itself. So, there's a treasure hidden somewhere in the school? Kaede clarified. Yep, yep! Monokuma affirmed. And that treasure might be just what you need to kickstart those missing memories in the old noggin! So, get money! Hold on, Shuichi interjected. This isn't another motive, is it? Motive? Perish the thought! Monokuma protested. So the treasure isn't a motive? The detective asked. Of course not! The burst scowled. You'll get your new motive tomorrow morning! He then disappeared before he could answer any other questions. Another motive? Kibo asked. What more could he have planned for us? It doesn't matter. Kaede reassured. As long as we all work together. He might get impatient and pull another time limit on us. Kokichi finished. The room went silent. What? Was that not where we were going with that? Kokichi, you can't just say things like that! The pianist argued. Well, it's true! Monokuma's not going to stop until he gets what he wants. Kokichi replied. Why not turn it into the skid and play ball for once? You wicked degenerate snail! Tenko spat. Are you proclaiming your killing intent? A flash of something truly insidious came over Kokichi's face as he replied. And what if I am? The group took a step back at Kokichi's flash of terror, only for him to quickly return to his old self. <laughs> I'm lying, of course. I have no plans to commit murder. An evil leader knows better than to get his own hands dirty. The short statured dictator then made a beeline out of the room. Kaede tried to take the reins of the discussion back. In any case, there's one last order of business. Shinichi, are you ready? Mm hmm. The detective replied. Moments later, the group was gathered outside the nearby women's bathroom. Rather, the male members of the group were, as the girls watched inside as Shuichi checked every nook and cranny for a secret entrance. Man, it's really cramped in here. Mew complained. Well, I doubt this place was built with the intent of holding seven people at once. Kaede replied. How long will this take? Himiko asked. As long as Shuichi needs. Aha! The sole male occupant cried. Did you find it? Kaede inquired. It's in the utilities closet. Shuichi shouted. Kaede rushed over to the closet and saw that the back wall had been opened, leading to a long hallway. Kirumi, get the guys up to speed and let's move. Kaede requested. You're letting all of the generate males in? Tenko protested. For this? Yes. As the group, later joined by the male students, made their way down the dimly lit hall, they eventually found themselves stopped. What in the... Kaede began. The path ahead had been blocked off by a large pile of rubble. Monokuma arrived, wearing a hard hat and worker's vest. Apologies! Some debris got in the way during construction! You'll have to find a detour! You've gotta be shitting me! Kaito exclaimed. You're really gonna try to pull this crap with us. As I said, sir, we're working to clear it, but it might take a while! The bear replied. 
Gonta can clear it out. The entomologist offered. Sorry, no civilians allowed on site. Now, please get back before I call security. By security, you wouldn't mean the exosols, would you? Shuichi asked. But of course! Monokuma snickered. With the road ahead blocked, the group was forced to turn back. Well, that was a total bust. Mew complained. It's my fault. Shuichi admitted. I should have pushed us to investigate last night. Maybe then Monokuma wouldn't have blocked the pathway yet. No worries, Shuichi. Kaido cheered. He was scared we were going to find all this stuff, so he stopped us. He's totally on the ropes. Kaido's right. Kaede added on. Whoever the real mastermind is, we can beat them if we just keep working together. The students eventually find themselves back in the girls' bathroom. Well, that's all we can do for now. Tenko summed up. Now, if you degenerate males can do us a favor and get the hell out of the girls' bathroom. As the students funneled out of the room, the group each went their separate ways, each student seemingly having their own plans for the evening. Only Kaede and Shuichi remained behind. So what's left for today? The pianist inquired. The only other appointment I have is more training with Kaito tonight. You're really gonna do that again? Well, I figure if I'm so weak I can barely move afterward. Shuichi explained sheepishly. Then I need to train so I can be ready for whatever comes our way. Hmm. Kaede pondered this. Something wrong? Is this training a boys only thing? Shuichi put his finger to his chin in contemplation. I don't think so. Well, sign me up! Kaede pumped her fists in emphasis. Shuichi brought his hand away from his chin. Are you sure? Yeah, I'll grab some gym clothes from the storage room. We'll all do some exercise, and we'll wake up feeling like we got some real work done. It'll be great! Kaede's million watt smile reassured Shuichi that the three man workout team would be a great idea. As Kaede woke the next morning, she suddenly understood Shuichi's hesitation the previous day. Oh, why did I do that to myself? The exhausted girl rolled out of the bed, barely holding on to the strength she would need to face the day ahead. Fortunately, a casino night wasn't until the following evening, so that wouldn't be too much of an issue. As she made her way to the closet, her eyes caught an object that brought an odd pop of color on her room's main table. What's this thing? She asked, as she took hold of the handheld device. The logo at the bottom read, Cubs Pad. The strange device, or cub's pad as it was apparently called, was certainly not something Kaede could ignore in good conscience. She examined the object thoroughly, but found nothing unusual. It appeared to be a handheld video player, but it lacked any opening to insert a disc or cartridge. There was also no discernible jack for a charger, or a place to swap out batteries. By all accounts, the device was a mess of engineering oversights. And yet, the one clear feature was a button to the side of the screen. Without thinking much of it, Kaede pressed the button. The screen flickered to life, and much to the pianist's shock, a familiar face came into view. So it's rolling? All right. Hey, future me. What's up? Me? Kaede muttered. But how... The person in the image was Kaede, no doubt about it. However, she was dressed in a blue school uniform and sitting in an unfamiliar room in front of a table. She was speaking directly to the camera, as though she had been prompted to do so. I know you're probably freaking out right now, but no worries. We made it this far, and now nothing can stop us. Okay. Kaede replied shakily. The whole thing was surreal. She had no memory of recording a message for herself, much less when she would have had the time. Last she could recall, she was kidnapped and woke up in the Ultimate Academy of Gifted Juveniles. We can make it all the way to the final two. 
It'll be easy as long as you remember the golden rule. No matter what anyone says or does, don't trust anyone. You got that? These people aren't your friends. They're the competition. They're probably even more cutthroat than we are. But that's not gonna stop us. Now go out there and show them what we're made of. The video cut out afterward, and Kaede was left in a state of shock. This was a lot of information to take in. Based on what was said, her past self knew she was about to take part in a killing game. More than that, she seemed to be okay with the idea. Downright eager, in fact. She was even advising Kaede to give it her all to successfully kill someone. But this was so far away from the self she knew. Her memories had been altered. She was aware of that. If Monokuma's words weren't enough, the occasional flashes of herself with some sort of device wired to her head made that perfectly clear. But was she really that kind of person? Well, she had been willing to kill the mastermind. Murder apparently wasn't that hard to rationalize in her mind. But so many other questions remained. When was that video made? Who was it that was filming? There had been someone else in the room with her, that was made clear. And if she was a willing participant, why did she remember being kidnapped? It was too many things at once. Maybe Shuichi could help. Kaede raced to her closet to get dressed for the morning. And then promptly collapsed, remembering that she was still aching from last night's workout. Once Kaede was properly attired for the day ahead, she arrived in the cafeteria, with the others already engaged in lively discussion. Hey, what's up, sleepyhead? Kaito cheered. I wasn't sleeping. She protested. I just took forever to get here thanks to your insane workout routine. She didn't even finish. <laughs> you and Shuichi both. You do need thicker skin. Kaede brushed past this claim. In any case, we might have an issue. This morning... There was a video player in your room? Shuichi cut her off. Same for all of us. I think it's the motive Monokuma told us about. Probably. Kaede replied. So, what do we do about them? If they are indeed meant to be motives, it would be best to simply not watch them. Kibo stated very matter-of-factly. You really unring that bell. Kaede admitted. What? Kibo replied with shock. No one else did, right? Oh, Gonta might have peaked. The hulking entomologist revealed. Atua told me not to, so I didn't. Was the artist's reply. Ryoma shook his head. Didn't really see the point either way. I did bear witness to mine. Correcchio explained. I found it quite breathtaking. I kept my curiosity under control. The Aikido master proclaimed. Self-discipline is the most important thing. I watched mine twice. Himiko admitted. Apropos of nothing. <laughs> Himiko! Tenko yelled in shock. The lack of a cohesive answer only left the robot even more flustered. No big deal. Kokichi argued. The way I see it, the best thing to do is to let everyone watch everyone else's video. Let us know where you stand. That is by far the worst option! Kibo protested. That will only serve to breed paranoia and distrust. But we'd all be cooperating. Kokichi replied, seemingly confused. Isn't that what everyone's been saying we should do? If we all work together, right? Whoa. Kibo hedged. Yes, but... Kokichi... Kaede interjected. Could it be you just want to see everyone's motive video for your own benefit? You've never been in favor of cooperation before. The supposed dictator smirked. Saw through my lines again, huh? Well, Keyboy's plan is bust, and so is mine. What do you suggest, fearless leader? Kaede pondered this for a moment. What do you all think? Who thinks it would be best to share each other's videos? Kokichi once again found himself as the only one raising his hand. Okay. The pianist replied. Who thinks it might be best just to destroy them all right now? Before this vote could be tallied, Monokuma leapt onto the scene. Not a chance! Huh? Was Kaede's response. I find out any 
many of you destroyed one of the videos I worked so hard to put together, heads will roll! The self-appointed headmaster declared. The clarion call of I'm sure son. signaled the arrival of his children. Monophony proclaimed. I couldn't bear the bodice and breaking them. Was that an old school bear pun, Mana Funny? Monosuke asked. Trying to score some easy brownie points with your old man? You gotta be kidding me! Mana Kid screamed. You think we're gonna let you just get away with that? Monophony is trying to be cute. Monodom asserted. We need a cute sister. Monocubs kinda are a sausage fest! Monokid acknowledged. Monodem's actually pretty smart! What? Monosuke protested. I thought I was the smart one! You're both smart! Monophony offered, ever the aspiring peacekeeper. We should get along! Monodem stated. So long! Farewell! And they once again disappeared. Regardless! Monokuma continued. New rule! Any object relevant to a motive cannot be destroyed! <laughs> Monokuma made his leave, and the telltale buzzing of the monopads made it clear that the rule was added to their list of regulations. Darn it. Kaede muttered. We didn't even get to ask if the videos were real. For now, we should assume they are. Shuichi declared. We'll just have to stick with Kibo's plan of not watching them, and we'll have to adhere to the honor system. With a general muttering of agreement, the group's discussion turned to planning the following evening's casino night. With a tray of breakfast in hand, Kirumi made her way to the third floor and knocked at the red door that consistently remained shut. The door creaked open slightly, and Maki made note of her visitor. Thank you. She acknowledged, before taking the tray off the maid's hands. While I have you, I was hoping to ask a favor. Kirumi commented. Hmm? I don't know whether you've heard, but we've all planned a casino night for tomorrow evening. I don't suppose you'd like to join us? I wouldn't. The child caregiver replied, pointedly. Regardless, I felt it best to keep you up to speed. Furthermore, I don't suppose you're hiding any formal attire in there? What? It wouldn't be proper to have a casino night without formal attire. Kirumi explained. <sighs> but we seem to be lacking in such things. Maki peered back into her own room, as if she were actually checking for something. No. Try some movies, old stuff. The door closed shut. How would I even go about that? Kirumi asked to no one. Rise and shine, Earth sign! <laughs> The exclamation was a bit off, however, as only Monodum appeared. If you require something from another room, I may fetch it. Anything? Kirumi asked. Nothing personal, only things that will help you get along. Did Samogi possess an formal attire for all of us? Monodum stood silent for a moment before responding. No. The maid sighed. That is quite a shame. I will gather some. It will help us get along. Ah. Kirumi intoned. Thank you for your assistance. You are very welcome. So long. Farewell. <laughs> the robotic bear left. Ryoma traversed his research lab backward and forward, and still he felt his energy was in a downward spiral. He could still remember a time in his life when the very idea of a private court all to himself would have given him much more cheer than he would know what to do with. But due to his vigilante crusade, all the courts stirred within him were bad memories. He picked up a ball and pondered it. Should I even bother? I would like it if you did. 
Ryoma raised the ball in defense and shifted his gaze behind him, only to discover that his unexpected guests were Kibo and Kaito. <sighs> Forgive my rudeness! I simply wish to see your skills! Kibo exclaimed. What skills? Ryoma replied. I have never seen a tennis match before. The automated adolescent explained. I wish to see one, and you and Kaido are the only ones who know how to play. Yeah, so come on! Kaito cheered, his jacket cast aside. Just a quick round, what do you say? Huh, Ryoma scoffed. My days as the ultimate tennis pro are long over. So? Kaito asked. I never was one, I, I still want to play. Please, Ryoma. Kibo requested. Or at least show me how to play. You wouldn't be able to keep up, Ryoma replied. Kaito cracked his knuckles. Ooh, them's fighting words! Oh, unless you're scared and you've lost your touch. That could not go unpunished. All right then. Ryoma shot back. One game, for all time's sake. Kibo quickly made his way to the sideline as Ryoma and Kaito stood at either side of the net. I'll let you serve first, Ryoma offered. You'll regret that. Kaito scoffed. The purple-haired boy tossed the ball into the air, struck it with the racket, and it soared to the other side of the net. And less than a second later, the ball was soaring in the opposite direction, past Kaito's head, and it quickly bounced to the ground beside him. Fifteen love, the shorter boy announced. Kaito gulped. I'm in trouble. Karekia was under the assumption that he would be the only soul brave enough to make a sojourn to the library after the events of the past few days. The image of Shuichi and Mew operating on the card reader behind the hidden door proved this assumption quite wrong. Might I ask what you two are up to? The anthropologist inquired. Shuichi was the one to answer. With the other passage blocked off, we're left with this card reader as our only way to enter the hidden room. As such, I asked Mew to see what she could do. Any luck thus far? I wish! Mew scoffed. The best I can do is disassemble his thing so I can reverse engineer a new one in my research lab. And even then, it probably won't tell me anything I don't already know. More's the pity, I suppose. Correcchio replied. Either way, we have to at least try. Shuichi supplied. Yeah, yeah, I get it, Puichi. You gotta give a girl time, you know? You gotta preheat the oven before you stick it in, am I right? Shuichi tugged at his collar in response. Sure. The two male students found themselves looking over a few books as they left the inventor to her work. She's not exactly the type of girl you bring home to mother, is she? Kurekio whispered. The detective shook his head in response. Not really. For me, a female companion should be the epitome of class and fine taste. The masked boy explained. Though I suppose I have high standards. I wouldn't have pegged you for a romantic, Shuichi commented. I am a romantic in the traditional sense of the word. I appreciate shows of refinement and high culture. Not surprising for one who specializes in my field, I suppose. And what of yourself? Hmm? In many of the detective stories I've read, the hero is drawn to a seductive femme fatale. Correcchio lifted a Philip Marlowe book in emphasis. In that case, Miu may be precisely your type. Shuichi chuckled. I admire the works of Raymond Chandler, sure. But even if I'm an ultimate detective, I'd consider myself half-boiled on my best day. A half-boiled detective? <laughs> Who would have ever heard of such a thing? I can still hear you. The two turned to the busy, busty blonde. What? I'm not good enough for either of you? Did... Did I do something wrong? There's no good way to answer that question. Correcchio muttered. Oh. Mew bounced back. Then am I too beautiful to even think about defiling? It's not that. Shuichi defended. You're certainly attractive. You're just... Not my time. Really? Mew challenged. Cause I could have sworn that busty blondes who like to wear pink had you written all over them. Shh, 
Shinichi blushed furiously. Ah, yes, his attraction to Kaede. Korekio noted. I was a fool to forget. That's... that's not... <laughs> Mew cackled. Poor Suichi got all tongue ties so now he can't run laps down south. Are you done with the reader yet? Shuichi exclaimed, desperate to change the subject. As much as I can do here. Mew answered. I'm off to the lab, trying not to stare as I walk out. She made her exit, and Karekio buried himself in a book. Definitely not. He muttered. I didn't even know that there were that many kinds of bugs. Gonta was incredibly grateful that one of his classmates was willing to observe his efforts to care for his new terrarium. His attempts to create a new insect meet and greet at the school had proven, shall we say, less than successful. Angie, however, had kept an open mind. Insects are the most prolific type of animal on the planet, Gonta explained. It's so amazing to Gonta that something so tiny can be capable of so much. Well, we're all kind of tiny when you think about it, Angie replied. Huh? It's like there are seven billion people on the planet, right? So each of us is super small in the big picture, but we still have something to add to that picture, you know? Gonta never thought of it that way. Angie, you're really smart. Angie chuckled. Not really. Atua just shares his wisdom with me, and I pass it on. But Gonta can't hear anybody, so Angie must be really special. Anyone can hear Atua if they try. Angie counted. It's kind of like how you can understand animals, and we can't. You just need to know what to listen for. Really? Gonta asked. What would Atua want to say to Gonta? Atua would be proud of you for taking care of these books. You show that you love all of Atua's creatures, big and small. That's the gentlemanly thing to do, Gonta replied with a nod. And Atua is the ultimate gentleman. He cares for everybody on the planet. And when you care for your books, you're doing the kind of good that Atua does. Gonta was awestruck. Gonta never knew he was that amazing. Gonta just thought he was being nice. And that's the first step, Gonta. Angie reassured. The second is to let Atua into your heart, and he'll let you know where to go from there. Okay, Gonta will try that. Cool! Angie cheered. Her student council was coming along nicely. As Kaede made her way to Himiko's lab, she found herself at an impasse. Was she shocked that Tenka was here watching or not? Logically, she shouldn't. Tenka was about as subtle about her feelings as a flying pig. However, it did seem odd since the two previously seemed at odds with one another. How are you two doing? Kaede asked. Just fine. Tenko chimed in. Did you need something? I just wanted to get a better idea of what Himiko's show was going to be. If there's a theme, I want my piano set to keep the tone of the night. Himiko sighed. I'm not sure what I should do. I'm torn between using water escape magic and separation magic. What's separation magic? The pianist inquired. You see that box? Himiko pointed toward a human-sized box segmented in three places showing a person being split from the head, torso, and legs. I could do that, but I thought it might raise bad memories. The thought of Sumugi's execution flashed through the girls' heads. Yeah. Kaede replied shakily. Maybe you shouldn't do that. But I've never tried water escape magic before. Himiko explained. I don't want to screw it up. Himiko could never screw up. Tenko protested. You're the ultimate mage! I know that whatever magic you try, you will amaze everybody. She's right, you know. Kaede encouraged. Anything's possible if you just set your mind to it. Himiko shrugged. So do you both swing that way, then? Kaede raised an eyebrow as Tenko began to fidget nervously. Tenko, are you okay? The blonde asked. I forgot to go on my afternoon run. I need to stay sharp. The Aikido master bolted from the room at a full sprint. What's her problem?
problem. Himiko wondered. Well, that was kind of a personal question. Kaede argued. If she does, you know, she might not be fully comfortable with herself yet. Why not? Well, I wouldn't really know. Kaede replied. I like guys. I mean, we're all on a spectrum. But I mostly like guys. And with the way Tenko acts, I wouldn't be surprised if she swings that way. But if she does, and she doesn't quite know how to process that, it may make her feel like you're antagonizing her. My birth mom always said to treat others how you want to be treated. Himiko countered. If someone asked me that, I wouldn't care. So if someone asked you, hey, Himiko, are you- Yes. A brief pause overtook the both of them. All right. Kaede continued. But if Tinko is, and she thinks you're not okay with that, she's just going to feel worse and worse, especially if she likes you. But I don't care if she is or not. I just want her to tell me. Himiko responded. Well, you might want to tell her that. Himiko nodded. Maybe, but I want to decide on my act first. And I'll help. Kaede offered. But you have to promise you'll have a serious talk with her about all of this. Okay. As they looked over the various magic items in the room, curiosity reared its ugly head. If she is... Kaede began. If she toned herself down a little. Himiko answered. Kokichi didn't mind that he had been left alone. It was all the better in his mind. The boy had a serious task ahead of him, and the chart he had made didn't help as much as he'd hoped it would. Okay, Positives from Maki as a minion are too high to count. He observed. But on the negative side, I'm pretty sure she hates my guts. And again, I think just about everyone does by now, so that's not that surprising. His eye turned to another chart, this one a spreadsheet. At least that's on schedule. Kokichi's dorm room was a mess of charts and notes. The ultimate supreme leader was dedicated to making sure everything he had planned would go smoothly, and keeping it all in front of him made it that much easier. I need to get her on my side somehow, but how do you get girls to like you? He scoffed at himself. <laughs> That's a question I never thought I'd ask myself. Woo! Looks like I win the pool! The self-proclaimed evil genius turned around to see Monokuma had barged in uninvited, as he was wont to do. Can I help you? Kokichi asked. Well, I couldn't help but notice how much work you put into all your schemes. You've got an eye for detail, kiddo. I respect that. Monokuma explained. Kokichi chuckled. Thanks. Evil can't just fly by the seat of its pants, you know. Oh, I know, I know! <laughs> Monokuma chuckled in kind. You remind me of me at your age. Always scheming. Always picking fights. And so bored of people. Mm -hmm. These other ultimates. Monokuma explained. They don't see it like we do. Life is boring when you live in harmony, but you, you get it. You're the type of guy who stirs the pot. I could use a guy like that. What do you say, kiddo? Monokuma raised a paw, as if to shake Kokichi's hand. Kokichi smirked and raised his hand in kind. Monokuma reached for the hand, and was promptly shocked by a joy buzzer. Ouch! What was that for? <laughs> Kokichi replied. You think I'd work for you? That didn't work out too great for your last little partner in crime now, did it? Well, I suppose history's not on my side. The bear admitted. But you really think you can survive this game without my help? The dictator shrugged. Who knows? But now I know something important. You do need someone among us to act as your little gopher. I don't need one. Monokuma clarified. It's just nice to have one. And I respect that. A good minion is hard to find. As such, I'd like it if you let me get back to work. 
Kokichi requested. Kiddo, you just made a big mistake. Chances like this don't come by twice. Monokuma warned. After the bear left, Kokichi breathed a sigh of relief. He's panicking. Just remember that he's panicking. The boy reminded himself. Not that Monokuma was the only one. As the day gave way to night, that night gave way to the day of casino night. As Monodem had promised, the students found that their closets, which previously held only copies of their uniforms, now had a piece of formal evening wear to aid the tone of the occasion. Kaede once again led the morning breakfast meeting. Okay, everyone, let's go over the plan one more time. The evening starts at 6 p.m. We'll give everyone about 15 minutes to gather together, and then we'll split up. We'll have free gaming until 7, and after that we'll move to the banquet dinner that Kirui prepared. That'll take us to about 7.45, which will give us 15 minutes to clean up before the poker tournament, which Miu has donated a top-secret prize for. She trailed off. It'll blow your mind holes! Miu boasted. I'm sure. Kaede deadpanned. At 9, we'll have 30 minutes for Himiko's magic show, which will feature a transmogrification spell. Himiko's magic will be sure to amaze us down. Tenko cheered. Himiko nodded silently. And I'll finish us up afterward with the piano performance. Kaido summarized. Any questions? Hey, I got one. Kaito chimed in. Where the hell's Makiro? I'm afraid she still will not leave her lab. Kirumi explained. God damn it. I have half a mind to give that girl a good talk to. The astronaut protested. You probably could have stopped if I have half a mind. Kokichi sneered. You be quiet! Kaito snapped. Nick me! Both of you, please contain yourselves! Kibo shouted. Fighting solves nothing! So you're not a combat robot? Kokichi inquired. You can't fight, you can't fly. How are you supposed to be the ultimate robot? I am fully functional! Kibo protested. So does that mean you do have a- ENOUGH! Kaede yelled. Can we please get through one meeting without a fight breaking out? Kaede is totally right. Angie agreed. If we all just listened to what the tour tells us, we wouldn't be having these kinds of problems. That's true. We should pay more attention to a tour, you know. Gonza cheered. The group was taken off guard by Gonza's claim. Gonza, you believe in Angie's a tour? Shuichi inquired. Mm hmm Angie explained it to Gonta, and it all makes perfect sense. Atua takes care of all of us like Gonta takes care of the insects. Humans are not insects! Tenko protested. I, for one, will not back down from an insult hurled by any degenerate male, even one as big as you. It's a figure of speech. Kimiko muttered. Tenko stepped back. All right, I should not react so much. Maybe you should run more. Kimiko offered. It'll burn off that extra energy. It's decided. I will run 10 more laps around school more than normal. The Aikido loving girl declared. I didn't mean that much. Himiko's words fell on deaf ears as Tenko set out. She's wound a bit tight, isn't she? Korekio commented. I've seen her run laps. Ryoma explained. She gets some of those workout clothes in the storeroom. It runs more times than I care to count. And she's pumping 10 kilo weights in each hand the whole way. Oh. Kaito muttered. Maybe we should add that to our training, eh? Shuichi, got it. What do you think? Kaede gulped, and Shuichi merely slammed his head down onto the cafeteria table. Not hearing a no. As the hour approached, Kaede, decked out in her new dress, knocked at Shuichi's door. Shuichi, are you ready yet? We've got a... She was interrupted as the door swung open. The detective stepped out dressed in a midnight blue three-piece suit. Wow. Kaede stammered. Shuichi simply blushed in response. It seemed that he too was taken aback though in his case by Kaede's slim scarlet backless dress. 
You, you look really nice, Shuichi said, finding his voice. Thanks, Kaede replied sheepishly. You too. The two stood in silence for just a moment. So we should get going, right? Shuichi asked. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The two left the dormitory in a somewhat embarrassed silence. The casino hall was abuzz with excitement as the class grouped up. All right, everyone. Thank you for coming. Kaede announced. Once again, we'll begin with a bit of free gaming, so play whatever floats your boat. However, anyone who wants to help Kurumi out with the food, you are free to do so. I insist that I don't require assistance. Kurumi commented. But we want to help. Kaede argued. Speak for yourself! Kokichi shouted. Anyway... Kaede said, changing the subject. Dinner's at 7, and the night ends with a nighttime announcement. So, until then, have fun! The 13 students went their separate ways, each with a task or game in mind. But as the group split up, Kokichi kept still. He had every intent of joining the festivities. But the trickster had an insidious plan in mind. He looked to his watch. 9.35. That's when I'll do it. God damn it! <laughs> Kaito lamented his luck. The slot machines were very much living up to their nickname of one-armed bandits, as far as the astronaut was concerned. These damn things are totally rigged! I must disagree. Kaido turned to see Ryoma had acquired quite a respectable haul from the nearby slots. What the hell? What are you doing so different from me? Nothing. It's all just blind luck after all. Man, you really are lucky, aren't you? Ryoma scoffed. A man in jail can hardly call himself lucky. Well, you aren't in jail now, Kaido argued. Technically, anyway. A prison's a prison. Do prisons have casino night? Do prisons have food like Kurumi's? Well, no. Ryoma begrudgingly replied. So cheer up, man. Life's going pretty good for you right now. Ryoma pondered this for a moment before his thought process was interrupted by a scream of frustration. Oh! The two turned to see Gonta, not doing so well at a driving game. Gonta didn't realize cars were this tricky. Kaito shook his head. A man's work is never done. Am I right? He walked towards the self-styled gentleman. Come on, bro. Let's have you try the fishing one. Ryoma watched this with calculating eyes. My life's going good, huh? The food was simply divine, as to be expected by now of Kirumi's work. The primary course consisted of thinly sliced trout with dishes of rice to the side. These dishes were all colored to resemble poker chips. There were deep fried satsumaage, vegetable nimono, and yakitori for people to choose from based on their preference. Dessert was set to be manju in the shape of various animals, such as dogs or cats. Bears were naturally excluded, of course. As the group dug in, light conversation persisted. So? Atua told me that Gonta was the perfect person to have join my student council. And I think it's all gonna work out great! Correcchio nodded at Angie's words. I must say, I find your belief system fascinating. I would love to discuss it more in depth at some point. Absolutely! I bet I can make a true believer out of Kyo. Correcchio chuckled. I don't really want to tie myself down to any one faith. No big deal. Angie explained. Atua takes whatever form you need to give you the guidance you seek. I see. Correcchio noted. Tell me, what does your Atua tell you about the afterlife? The afterlife? Yes. I've always held a soft spot for learning more about interpretations of that particular concept. The anthropologist shared. Of course. Angie exclaimed. Okay, so when you die, your spirit goes to be one with Atua. So when a tour is with you, the people you love who are dead are with you too! This intrigued Correcchio. Ah, I see. I've often believed I've heard the voice of someone I lost. Oh? Who was it? The artist asked. The girl I loved. 
Karekio replied, barely above a whisper. I don't really like to talk about it. That's no problem. Angie reassured. You can tell me more when you're comfortable with it. I'll keep that in mind, Karekio said. Angie failed to notice the sinister tone the long-haired boy had adopted in that moment. The poker tournament had been divided into three separate tables of four players, which would result in three finalists who would face off in one last match. Kirumi chose not to play and instead operated as the dealer. Alright then, we're down to the last hand. Kirumi announced. The three finalists glared at each other. <laughs> Do you really think you can outwit an ultimate supreme leader? Kokichi taunted. Kibo said nothing and merely looked over his cards. Bring it on, liar boy! Mew shot back. Kokichi had won his round by bluffing unmercifully, to the shock of very few. Kibo had won with careful calculations of which cards were still in play and determining his odds of victory. Mew? No one was quite sure how she got this far. It was worthy to note, however, her three previous opponents were all male. Kirumi flipped over the fourth card. A seven of hearts. Kokichi quickly snuck a peek at his watch. Noting the time, he remarked, Let's say we make this interesting. In what regard? Kibo asked. In response to this questionnaire, Kokichi pushed his moderate stack of chips into the pot. All in! You sure? Mew taunted. You haven't even seen the last card yet. Mew was right to be cocky. That seven of hearts was paired with a seven of spades also on the table. And she held another seven in her hand, along with a queen. Kibo observed the table. The four cards Kirumi had laid down were the two sevens, as well as a ten of hearts and a jack of spades. Kibo's hand contained the eight and nine of hearts. Two different cards could give him a straight flush, and neither had been played in this round. The robot pushed his pot in. I will call! Mew chuckled. Fuck! Out down! She too added her chips. Kirumi smiled. Very well. The final card was flipped, revealing... A Joker! Joker! The three exclaimed. Of course. Kirumi replied. We never said we weren't using one. Whatevs. Mew scoffed. She revealed her cards. Joker the seven. Four of a kind. Queen high. Kibo nodded and revealed his hand. I used the Joker as the six of hearts. Straight flush to the ten. What? Mew shouted. Man. Kokichi. Kirumi inquired. What cards do you have? <laughs> Kokichi chuckled. He laid down his two cards. The nine and ten of spades. Oh, bullshit! Mew exclaimed. Why would you go all in on an inside straight? Kibo questioned. Kokichi smirked and gathered up the chips. You're just jealous because I won. So, what's my prize? Mew perked up. I'm glad you asked. The blonde inventor promptly stuffed her hand down her top and retrieved a flash drive. Um, was all Kokichi could muster. This baby's got storage capacity like you couldn't believe. You could hide a body in there. Mew bragged. Kokichi hesitantly took hold of the drive. I really hope you're talking about the flash drive. Um... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to Himiko Yumano's Magic Extravaganza. Himiko's announcement gathered a bit less fanfare than one might have hoped, but that comes with the territory, when your main star is half asleep most of the time. The group had gathered in the main hall, where Himiko had set up a magic box. For my first spell, I will require a volunteer. Himiko explained. To no one's shock, Tenko's hand shot up like a rocket. Pick me! Pick me! Himiko shrugged. Come on up. 
Katenko squealed with joy as she made her way to the magic box. Kaede smiled and nudged Shuichi, who stood next to her. Aren't they adorable together? Together? Shuichi inquired. Well, maybe they're not together. Kaede admitted. But they would be adorable, right? I'm really not the person to talk to about romance. Well, me either. The pianist replied. But I'm rooting for them. As this exchange continued, Tenko entered the magic box, which Himiko proceeded to close. Now I will use my transmogrification magic to change Tenko's form. Himiko tapped her magic wand against the closed box twice. Behold! She declared as she proceeded to open the box. As the box flew open, a swarm of doves flew out, filling the room in a flurry of feathers. The others were thrown into a frenzy. What the hell? Kaito shouted. What have you done to Tenko? Kibo exclaimed. Himiko's magic is a miracle! Angie cheered. Atua must be with her. Himiko let out a sharp whistle and the doves returned to the open box. She closed it once more. And now, I will change her back. She tapped the box twice again. And once she opened it this time, Tenko did indeed step out. The Aikido master seeming somewhat dazed by the events. I feel funny. She claimed, holding her head. Ta-da! Kimiko announced, to the applause of the astounded class. Yo, Shuichi. Kaito muttered to his friend. You're a detective, right? How'd she do that? Shuichi pondered this for a moment. I don't know the nature of the trick, but one of two things must have happened. Either it's a trick where the volunteer doesn't matter, or she and Tenko worked on the trick together in secret. I bet it's the second one. Kaede beamed. A shared smile between Himiko and Tenko lent credence to that idea. The final event of the night began as Kaede made her way to the piano. She cracked her knuckles as she sat down and proceeded to double-check her sheet music. Kaito scoffed. I don't get the big deal. She's the ultimate in her field. Shuichi reminded his friend. It's still piano. Kaito counted. It's gonna put me to sleep, especially this late. Just let her perform. Shuichi chided. Fine, fine. Kaito muttered. It's cause you like her. Huh? If Kaede had heard this exchange, she elected to ignore it and proceeded with her first number. It was a tune that all the members of the group had heard before. The song was quite popular throughout Japan. And yet, as Kaede played it, the pep and amusement of the song seemed livelier than usual. It was as if a long-lost friend had returned after many years and wanted nothing more than a day of relaxation. And yet, the tune was one tinged with sadness. The lyrics were quite dissonant to the tone of the song. And the others realized perhaps this was Kaede's way of paying tribute to Rantaro and Samugi. Though they barely knew Rantaro, and Samugi was a traitor, it seemed wrong to just allow their passing to go unnoted. With the end of the old crooning number, the group clapped. You were saying, Kaito? Shuichi taunted. Okay. Yeah, that was nice. The astronaut admitted. Kaede began another piece. This one was different in that it started somber and grew progressively more upbeat. It was as though the clouds left by the previous song had broken and the sun was allowed to shine through. The class felt that this song was Kaede's way of saying they could take on the world.
Shuichi, however, took a different interpretation. He believed Kaede was trying to say she had found her strength again. She had been through much in the past few days, and was only now seeming herself again. Casino Night was her pet project, and it seemed as though it was going to be everything she had hoped for. Once again, the piece was met with applause. No commentary was made as Kaede transitioned into her final number. The closing number was amazing in its complexity. Kaede's hands never stopped moving as her fingers fluttered across the keys, quickly picking each note with expert precision. The song was energized and touching all at once. This was undoubtedly an anthem cheering the group on. There was nothing that could stop them if they stood as one. And Kaede's music made that clear. After the final notes played, Kaede stood to take her bow. The group was more than happy to give her the praise that the ultimate pianist had earned. Kaede made her way back into the sea of people and took in various compliments and congratulations. However, her main focus was drawn to one person in particular. Shuichi, did you like it? The detective blushed. Yeah, of course. Just... What? I was kind of surprised Claire de Lune wasn't in your set. He explained. You talked it up so much before. Well... Kaede fidgeted a bit. That's really more of a you piece than an everyone piece. Some other time though, definitely. Okay. Shuichi accepted. From the corner of his eye, he could see Kaito giving him a thumbs up. Well... Kaede declared. Just about night time, so let's hit the hay. We're still on for training, you two. Kaito reminded. Kaede and Shuichi sighed. The good mood that had pervaded the group shattered with an announcement by Kirumi. We're missing someone. The group looked around, trying to figure out who was gone. Kibo chimed in and revealed. Tokichi is nowhere to be found. I remember seeing him in the audience during my magic show. Kimiko noted. Then, he slipped out during Kaede's set. Mew supplied. But why would he just leave without saying goodbye? Angie wondered. A dark thought shot through Shuichi's brain as he burst into a run. Where are you going? Kaede cried back. The dorms! The class arrived to the main dorm hall too late. Shuichi stood in front of a large cardboard box and the box contained two things of note. Kaede made the first all too clear. Are those the motive videos? Shuichi nodded. Yeah. He then held up a piece of paper. Kokichi left a note for us. As Shuichi read Kokichi's message to the group, the true terror of what happened sank in. Sorry, I had to slip out. But there's this movie series I've been dying to see. I made sure to label them to make sure everyone gets theirs back. So no worries. Love and kisses, Kokichi. Kokichi had stolen their motive videos, and it was clear he had watched all of them. The group stood in silence. At least most of them did. Some of them weren't that patient. Hey! Asshole! Open this goddamn door! Mew was pummeling Kokichi's door in frustration, but the dictator seemed to be choosing to ignore it. Mew, I don't think anyone's gonna answer to that. Kaede chided. Well, what do you want me to do, Kaede? That little brat just played all of us for saps and we fell for it hook, line, and sinker. I realize that. The pianist replied. But what's done is done, and it's not like we can make him forget what he's seen. I'm open to suggestions as to our next course of action. Kirumi offered. 
All right. Kaede began. Who thinks we should go with Kukichi's original plan of watching everyone's videos? The group was hesitant at first, but Kaede decided to break the ice and raise her hand. What do you say? Kibo exclaimed. That is precisely what Kokichi was aiming for with this course of action. But it's the only way to keep him from using this against us. Kaede countered. We need to know what we're in for. No. Tenko countered. I will not allow any degenerate male to control me. I feel we can avoid complication by exercising proper self-control. The Aikido master marched to the box and acquired her video. I'll be happy to share if everyone else agrees. However, I must advise that this is the wrong course of action. Tenko's right. Himiko agreed. Keeping yourself under control is the best thing to do. <laughs> Himiko called me by my first name. Tenko cheered. She then realized she was in mixed company and reined herself back in. Sorry. Atua told me that watching the videos is a no-no, so I don't think we should. The artist proclaimed. I would prefer if my privacy could be kept. Kurekio requested. Gunta agrees with Angie. The entomologist added. It became clear that no one was willing to share their videos with one another. Kaede took a breath and continued. All right. So, for now, we take our videos back and... We'll figure out what to do about Kukichi in the morning. The group agreed to this, and each made their way back into their rooms after retrieving their videos. Kaede looked down at her cubs pad and considered what to do now. Training with Shuichi and Kaito came first, but maybe that was the answer. Kokichi lounged about in his bed and chuckled. He had no way of knowing what the others were saying or doing right now, but he could guess. The chaos and paranoia that would be caused by what he'd done was sure to make things interesting. Tragically for his own safety, he'd have to miss the bulk of it. A short knock on his door broke his lazy stupor. Hmm? He looked to his watch. She must have gone back earlier than I thought she would. He stood up from his bed and tried to bring himself as much composure as he could. What was coming would not be pleasant, and one wrong move would cost him everything. But if he played his cards right, everything would fall into place. He opened the door just a crack and saw that it was indeed whom he expected. Maki, good to see you. The child caregiver's eyes were cold and lifeless as she forced her arm through the gap in the door. Kokichi stepped back instinctively, giving her the room to open the door, make her way in, and close it behind her. Can I help you somehow? Maki again said nothing. Actions spoke louder than words, after all. She made her point very clear as she grabbed Kokichi by the throat and began to squeeze. <coughs> Kukichi gasped for breath, desperately struggling. But rather than trying to escape, he fidgeted with his belt buckle. This bizarre course of action was enough to distract Maki from her rage. Why are you loosening your belt? She asked. Kokichi gave an evil smirk as he responded. Because you're choking me, it makes it too tight. <sighs> she dropped him to the ground in disgust. The boy took deep breaths, trying to regain his strength. You saw my video. What did you find out? Maki's tone was flat, all business. <laughs> Nothing that unusual. I mean, it was written all over your face from the beginning. Kokichi taunted. But if you must know. Kokichi cautiously made his way back to his bed and acquired a cubs pad from under his pillow. He pressed play. As the screen flared to life, Maki's face appeared as opposed to his own. To my future self, I don't know why this even needs to happen. I shouldn't have to tell you what to do. You're the ultimate assassin. This isn't hard. The message was notably short, but very much to the point. There was no doubt now that Kokichi knew about Maki's hidden talent. Kokichi took control of the conversation once more. So, ultimate child caregiver. Sure, I bet you take real good care of people. In fact, if I ever need someone taken care of, I'll be sure to give you a call. 
If you know who I am, you should be a bit more concerned about your situation. Lucky wand. Oh my dear ultimate assassin. Kokichi chided as he put the pad back in its hiding spot. I'm the one who holds cards right now. Do you really think you can get through a class trial when you don't have an alibi for three days straight? Maki narrowed her gaze. What do you want? Kokichi brushed off this question. Nothing yet, but I'll be sure to keep you posted. Maki turned away and gave one last question. My video? I'm holding on to that one, yes. Then the one you put my name on instead... Call it a gift. Kokichi gave a sickly sweet smile. I'm sure you know what needs to be done. Maki said nothing as she left the room. Kokichi brought his hands together in wicked triumph. She's mine now. Shuichi and Kaito waited patiently in the nearby grass. The stars above glimmered with a silvery light. However, the two were looking downward at the moment, uncaring at the cosmos above. Are we sure about this, Shuichi? Kaito asked. You're the one who always says I need to grow some backbone. Shuichi reminded him. Yeah, I guess. Kaede made her way to the group in her fitness attire, but more to the point, she also held her cubs pad. Kaede, Shuichi said, noting the pad. I know. She replied, softly. I know nobody wants to do this, but I trust you guys too much not to. I don't want to go around with Kukichi knowing while you guys don't. Kaito smirked. <laughs> Guess great minds stick alike. With this statement, he and Shuichi revealed that they too had brought their pads with the intent of sharing. <laughs> Kaede's eyes widened. You guys... We can trust you. That's the one thing I'm sure of. Shuichi explained. So, we need to do this. Kaede nodded in affirmation. Right. So, who first? I'll go. Shuichi and Kaede crowded on either side of Kaito as he pressed play. Once again, the screen came on, showing the purple-haired boy. Yo! Hard to believe I'm talking to future me. <laughs> Crazy, right? But anyway, you totally made it big. Pat on the back, man. Anyway, you better hop to it. You've got free reign to bash some skulls in. So you better take advantage of it, am I right? When's that gonna ever happen again? Fame and fortune's waiting on the other side, bro. Like we always say, the impossible is possible. All you gotta do is make it so. So do it already. The clip stopped, leaving Shuichi and Kaede quite unnerved. Fucked up, isn't it? Kaito commented lifelessly. Well... Kaede began. Maybe this isn't really us. Maybe it's just... He said my motto. Kaito countered. I'm positive it was me. I'm more concerned about the assertion that fame and fortune was waiting for you. Shuichi commented. Yeah, that's the part I didn't get either. Kaito replied. It's not like there's a cash prize for getting out of here alive. Or at least no one told us there was. Kaede made a note of this. Our past selves, if that's who they really are, seem to know a lot more about the killing game than we do. So in your video, do you talk about the killing game? Shuichi wondered. I'm starting to think that's the theme. Kaede surmised. To wit, she played her video. <laughs> Once again, the strange message played, and the boys took in the information about Kaede's advice to avoid trusting others. What the fuck happened to us? Kaito exclaimed. If this was us, why were we cool about killing people? And why are we acting like us? I don't know. Kaede replied defeatedly. Shuichi, what is yours like? Shuichi turned his gaze away, and wordlessly handed his pad over. Shuichi! What's wrong, man? The astronaut inquired. Just watch. The black-haired boy mumbled. Taking the instruction to heart, the other two students turned the video on, revealing one final clip. Shuichi appeared on screen, seemingly more nervous than usual. Um, hello, future me. I, I guess there's not really a point to that since I can't hear you back. But, um, I hope you're doing well. You're an ultimate detective, right? 
That's good. No one will suspect you. So you can pull off a great twist killing. Just like we wanted, right? And maybe we'll get that execution we were hoping for, too. I... I guess that's all I wanted to say. Good luck. The video cut out, and the two viewers were left to process what they just heard. Sh Shuichi. Shuichi said nothing. It was one thing to hear yourself encourage you to kill someone, but to hear yourself encourage you to get yourself executed? That was significantly more unsettling. Shuichi, bro. Kaito began, putting his hand on the boy's shoulder. Do... Do you want to talk about that? Not really, he admitted. I'm not even sure where I'd start. Do you think about it a lot? Kaede wondered. About what? Dying. She clarified. Sometimes, he revealed. Not about killing myself or anything. But I sometimes worry someone will try to kill me. Makes sense after all. Get rid of the detective, make the investigation harder for everyone. But, do you ever think about getting executed, like... The words fell dead in Kaede's mouth. Like she did. Not as of yet, Shuichi replied. I can't really see myself killing someone in the first place. I sometimes do. The pianist admitted. She continued before the boys could respond. I have nightmares about us not realizing Samugi was lying to us. And then I get found guilty after all, and I... She shuddered. <laughs> the memory of those dreams was fresh in her mind. Hey, we don't gotta worry about it. Kaito offered. None of us are gonna kill someone. How can you be sure? Kaede asked. I've already stooped to murder is the answer once, what's stopping me from doing it again? The fact that you're worried about it. Kaito countered. Huh? You're so scared about the fact that you tried to kill someone, that you'll never go anywhere near that part of yourself again. That part of you's not going away or anything. But you're not going to listen to it. He explained. And maybe that's not the healthiest way to deal with it. But we can deal with our PTSD after we're out of here. As far as I'm concerned. Kaede caught her breath again as she responded. Yeah, you're right. I won't let myself go that far again. Kaito turned to his other friend. Shuichi, do you want to die? No, he replied without thinking. Well, that's that. That can't be the end of it, Shuichi replied. It's the only part that matters, Kaito said with a shrug. And if you ever, and I mean ever start thinking otherwise. You find me or Kaede straight away, and we'll help you. You got it? Shuichi refocused his gaze on the two, and nodded. Right. Okay. If it's settled, I say... It's exercise time! Kaede and Shuichi nodded, and set to work. At some point, you just accept that it's happening. The next morning meeting was like a cold slap in the face from reality. Attendance had been cut in half. Kaede and her two exercise partners were there, of course. But Angie, Gonta, and Kibo were the only others to join them. Any idea where the others are? Kaede asked the room. Kirumi said she was collecting laundry, Shuichi offered. I told her we could handle breakfast for the day. To my knowledge, the others all wish to be left to process things on their own terms. Kibo explained. I knocked on a number of doors this morning, but a few of them simply refused to answer. Well, there are six of us here now. Kaede noted. Even if we come to a consensus, that's not enough to deal with Kokichi by majority rule. Not that you'd reach a consensus. The group turned to see an unexpected arrival. Maki stood in the cafeteria doorway, arms crossed. Maki? Kaede asked after the other girl. The red-eyed girl said nothing and made her way to the main table. She dropped a single scrap of paper down. Kokichi slipped that under my door. Figured you might want to read it. Kaede snatched up the paper and began to read. Dear everyone, I realize you're probably all mad at me. For my own safety, I elected to remain in my room until I am no longer permitted to do so. Don't worry, I stocked some snacks so I won't starve to death. Probably. See you soon. Go Kichi. That fucking asshole. 
asshole. Kaito Judd. Where does he get off? Thinking we're gonna let him get away with this. Well, whatever you do, leave me out of it. Maki requested. She turned and made her way out. Wait, Maki roll! Kaito cried out. Stop calling me that. She responded, not breaking her stride. As she left, Kaede turned to Shuichi. Can you handle things from here? Uh, sure, he replied. Kaede took that as her signal to move. She left the cafeteria and quickly caught up with Maki. Wait! The fake child caregiver groaned. What do you want? I want to know why you're excluding yourself. Kaede explained. I get that you prefer to be alone or whatever, but you don't have to lock yourself in your lab all day. I can do whatever I want. Maki shot back. I know, I know. Kaede reassured. But I'm saying that we're willing to let you in, and I'm starting to get worried about you. Worried? Well, yeah. Kaede rubbed her arm, as if she had gotten a sudden chill. Feeling alone in a situation like this, where every second is life and death? We can do things to people. Like what happened to you? Maki replied, pointedly. Yeah. Kaede barely choked out. I don't want anyone to feel that way ever again. I want everyone to work together, and we can't do that if you keep leaving yourself out. Okay. Maki began. One, I'm not scared of dying in this godforsaken place. Two, you're right. I prefer to be alone. And three, stop talking to me like you know what's best for me. You don't know the first thing about me. Maybe I would if you let me talk to you. The pianist shouted back. This discussion is over, Maki said, her tone flat. She again made her way to the research lab. Kaede only had one more thing to ask. If you're not afraid of dying, what are you afraid of? The red-eyed girl stopped cold. She turned her steely gaze back to the blonde and very plainly answered, Nothing. You're afraid of something, Kaede challenged. That's why you lock yourself in your lab. You're not afraid of dying. You're afraid of us. Maki scoffed. I'm not scared of this little collection of crazy people. No. Kaede clarified. You're scared that if you let us in, we'll see the real you. And you don't like the idea of people knowing the real you. Don't lie. We both know that's what it is. Maki shook her head. Let me make one thing very clear. She would never get to finish that sentence. The monitors in the hall sprang to life and Monokuma made his appearance. A body has been discovered! Everyone please gather to the location of the corpse! The pool building! The screens flickered off. The two girls were left standing in silence. What? Kaede stammered out. Mon! Maki shouted. With a short nod of agreement, the two raced toward the pool building. As the two girls arrived, they soon found themselves greeted by their cafeteria mates, as well as the missing members of the group. Kaede! Shuichi exclaimed. Shuichi! Where's the- It's in the actual pool. Kaede made her way to the main room of the pool building, and found herself greeted by a haunting sight. The once crystal clear water was now stained with blood, almost entirely dyed in its hue. Floating amidst the tainted liquid were a large number of life preservers, and, more to the point, a body. The body of the ultimate anthropologist, Korekio Shinguji. Karekio's waterlogged corpse bobbed in the shallow pool. The group stood around in stark silence. They were certain that what had happened before was a fluke. No one would ever actually try to kill someone. Not without the time limit. Not without the mastermind looming in the background. And yet, the soaked body of their friend made it clear that they were very, very wrong. Kaede was the one to break the silence. He told me he had a sister. Hmm? Shuichi intoned, 
turning to face her. She's probably worried sick. She continued. Wondering where he is. Wondering if he's okay. And now? She doesn't even know her own brother is dead. Kaede. I just think about what I'd do if something happened to Kaori, and I... Kaori? Shuichi inquired. My sister. The blonde clarified. Well, my twin sister, if you want to be technical. Oh. This conversation stopped in its tracks as the final member of the group arrived. <laughs> so, what I miss? The telltale cackle of Kokichi threw a number of the group into a rage. You piece of shit! Mew spat. I can't believe you would dare show your face to us! Kokichi! You have much explaining to do! Kibo demanded. We can worry about that later. Kokichi brushed off. Hey, Monokuma! The two-toned Teddy took heed of his herald and took point. Speak of the devil and there he is! The rest of the class grew tense. What's wrong, everybody? No one in the mood for a mid-morning swim? I'm sure you're The clarion cry of the cubs signaled their sudden showing. Oh dear. Monophony said, noting the dead body. Another horrible murder. It's enough to make you... You... <laughs> the pink bear heaved and let loose a river of sparkly bile. Gross! Monosuke chimed in. What do you eat to make that stuff happen? Monophony is not being very cute. Monodem commented. Who cares what Monophony does? Monokid copped. We got a dead body! And that means we finally get to party! Monokid, you really do get what life's all about, don't ya? Monokuma cheered. Hell yeah! Getting praise from the old man's totally the best! Perhaps was the love for us! Monosuke wondered. We should get along, Monodem argued. The trial will make it easier for us to get along. You can even talk about something so cruel! Monophony replied incredulously. Oh, Monophony, my dear daughter! You've got a bit too much of your aunt in you! Monokuma observed. Enough with the family reunion! Kaito shouted. Did you just get this over with already? Temper, temper! Monokuma chided. But if you insist... A chime went across the group's monopads. I've sent you your newest edition of the Monokuma file! Good luck investigating! You'll need it! Monokuma disappeared, his cubs following with a So long, farewell! With the Monokuma family gone, the group went into mission mode. Okay. Kaede began. Where do we start? You mean where do you start? Maki corrected. I want no part of this. You are part of this, whether you want to be or not. Kaede argued. Your life is just as much on the line as everyone else's. Regardless, I don't think I'll be of much help. See you at the trial. Maki left the pool building without turning to look at the others. Jeez, Kaito said. So pissed in her corner, boys. In any case, Shuichi cut in, already reading the Monokuma file. We need to get started. As expected of Shuichi. The astronaut cheered. Put him on a case, and he's getting things done in no time. What's the plan, Shuichi? Kaede asked. First we check the Monokuma file. He replied. The file read as thus. The victim was the ultimate anthropologist, Karekio Shinguji. He was found dead in the pool. The time of death is unknown. The cause of death is a knife wound to the heart. There are a series of similar stab wounds all across his upper torso. In addition, his right arm is broken. With the time of death unclear, we need to get a better picture of when the last time someone saw him alive was. Shuichi explained. I'll talk to the others. Kaede noted. Can I leave the crime scene to you? Me and Shuichi have got this. Kaito affirmed. You do your thing. You're helping? Shuichi questioned. Yeah, man. You're my assistant in this investigation. 
Shouldn't it be the other way around? Kaede commented. Nah. This way, if Shuichi screws up, it's my fault, not his. That's... Kaede searched for the right way to phrase it. Almost noble. We'll meet back up to exchange information in about half an hour, Shuichi declared. Sounds good. Kaede replied. With that, the group split up. So you are the first one to discover the body, Kurumi. The maid responded to Kaede with a nod. Yes. I arrived at the pool with the intent of checking the changing room. I was instead greeted with this. Sorry you had to see that. Kaede offered. It's fine. Someone had to, I suppose. Still, why were you checking the changing room to begin with? Kaede wondered. I set up a laundry basket back there in case anyone wanted to leave their dirty clothes there instead of taking it back to their rooms. Kirumi explained. Ironically enough, the basket was empty when I arrived. Is that normal? The pianist inquired. Quite so. Most folks don't actually use the changing room after all. Kirumi reminded. Yeah. Kaede acknowledged. I switch into workout gear for nightly training, but I usually just wear it to bed afterward. Kirumi's eyes widened with shock. Oh dear, I hadn't considered the bedclothes. I should be washing those more regularly as well. No, no, you're fine. Kaede reassured. Anything else I should know? Hmm. The silver-haired girl pondered this. Ah. I raced to the dorms to inform the others of what had happened. Himiko and Tenko were the ones who came with me. So they were both still in the dorms, and Kuhichi probably was too. I knocked on as many doors as I could. Kirumi said. I wasn't sure who was in the dorms and who was otherwise located. Location doesn't mean much if we don't know when Kiyo was killed. Kaede lamented. I'm sorry. The last I saw of him was just after we found our motive videos in that box. That's the last time I saw him too. Kaede grumbled. It's just too wide of a gap. With new information in hand, Kaede continued her search for the others. Kiba rose from the watery depths for a given value of depths, carrying the late Kurekio's body. The automaton wore an expression of melancholy on his chrome face and laid him beside the pool. Thanks for your help, Kibo. Shuichi said with a comforting tone. It is the least I can do. We are all quite fortunate my chassis is watertight. Kibo replied. So, what's the word on this guy, Shuichi? Kaito wondered. Shuichi poked and prodded at the wounds. Water damage has made it difficult to tell how old these wounds are. The blood mixed into the pool water, so we can't really judge based on that either. If I might ask, why did the culprit fill the pool with life preservers as well? Kibo inquired. I think there was blood on them too, Shuichi theorized. It's all to cover the time of death as much as possible. Yes, whoever did this was thorough. Kaito noted. They really went to town on Kyo. That does worry me, Shuichi thought out loud. Why stab him more than once? A wound that deep would easily result in death by blood loss, even if the first try missed the heart. And how did his arm get broken? Perhaps it happened when he fell in the pool. Kibo offered. Maybe. The detective replied, unsure if that were the case. On the other side of the pool, Gonta ran a butterfly net across the water, seeing if there was anything that had eluded their sight. Angie stood by him, offering verbal encouragement. Atua believes in you, Gonta. Just listen to Atua's voice and let him guide your hands. Right, Gonta will listen. Gonta closed his eyes in concentration, hoping that this time he would hear what Angie had often spoke of. Gonta thought back to the times when the bugs were sick or injured, and he would offer whatever he could to help them. Insects were so fragile, anything could kill them. Tenko's previous words rang in his mind that humans weren't insects. Humans are not insects! I, for one, will not back down from an insult hurled by any degenerate male, even one as big as you! Even so, they were all fragile, and like the bugs, Gonta needed to do what he could to protect them. Gonta, you did it! 
Gonta's eyes opened, unaware that he had kept moving the net. He lifted it, and much to his shock, there lay the evidence the group sought. A decorative knife, sharp enough to pierce human skin, but with a very flashy design on the hilt, emblazoned with the mark of a Chinese-style dragon. Shuichi walked over carefully, noting the puddles Kibo had left behind. So, is that the murder weapon? He questioned. The entomologist shrugged. Gonta thinks it might be. Gonta, you are amazing! Angie cheered. Atua was there! He guided your net! Speaking of which... Shuichi interjected. I've been meaning to ask, did that come from your lab? Hmm? Gonta intoned. No, Gonta found this in his room when he first got here. That's odd, Shuichi said, putting his finger to his chin. I didn't have anything in my room except more of my uniform. It's not that weird, Angie argued. I had my paintbrush and mallet with me, and Gonta woke up wearing his insect cage, right? I suppose, Shuichi replied. But the bigger question is, where did this knife come from? A series of knocks rapped at the door of Maki's research lab, and once again she found herself forced to greet an unwelcome visitor. What do you want now? She asked. The visitor, Kaede, held firm. I need to know what you've been up to as of late. Kokichi's words flashed through Maki's mind. Do you really think you can get through a class trial when you don't have an alibi for three days straight? You suspect me because I've been absent for several days. I don't suspect you, actually. Kaede corrected. I don't think you've got it in you to kill someone. It was a testament to Maki's emotional fortitude that she didn't burst out laughing. If you don't suspect me, what do you want to know? Mio and Ryoma both said they woke up early and went to their research labs this morning. I get that. Where were you? I woke up came to the cafeteria, and got stuck talking to you. Maki stated plainly. Are we done? When was the last time you saw Kyo alive? Days ago. Ugh! Kaede screamed. Why doesn't anyone know when he died? That's the point of hiding the time of death. Maki shot back. What did you expect? A stopped clock? I don't know! Kaede replied in frustration. She took a breath and tried a more open approach. Last trial, we only found out what happened because of the lack of an alibi. But now we don't even have a time frame and almost nobody has an alibi anyway. Yeah, tough. Maki offered. Do you have anything that could help? Kaede asked. Maki thought for a moment. His motive video. She offered. What about it? It might help if you watch it. There was almost no end to the shelves, the boxes, the pallets of various items laying about the storeroom. But much to Shuichi and Kaito's dismay, there was nothing even remotely similar to the knife they found in the pool. What the hell, man? We don't have time to waste checking these damn boxes! Kaito exclaimed in frustration. Shuichi begrudgingly agreed. You're right. I think it's safe to say wherever that knife came from, it wasn't here. So where did it come from? The astronaut wondered. I don't think it came from the mono machine or the casino prizes. Shuichi theorized. So that leaves the possibility that someone had it on them when we arrived, or that it was in a room we haven't gotten the chance to search. There was a crashing noise behind them, and the two turned to look. Tenko and Himiko stood there, with embarrassed looks on their faces. What were you two up to? Kaito asked. I was just looking to see if there was something for Nose's stomach. She explained. Himiko was looking a bit woozy. You really shouldn't worry about me so much. Himiko chided. But I do worry about you, Himiko. The Aikido master protested. People might make the mistake of thinking you're weak and target you. Mistake? Himiko parroted. Of course. You have the power of magic. And more than that. Tenko knelt down, so as to look the shorter girl in the eye. You have a strong heart. Huh? Himiko, you've been keeping yourself under control this entire time. I can feel the powerful emotions you're trying to contain. And you've proven time and again how strong your inner discipline is. 
It's not that. Kimiko argued for a given value of argue. Being emotional is just a hassle. Tenko shook her head. That's not it. And we both know it. Your heart is more than just strong. It's big. So big that I can tell you care about a lot of people. I really admire that. Himiko blushed a little at this. Thank you. Not to break up the love fest. Kaito chimed in. But do you two have any clue about what was going on? I'm afraid not. Tenko replied. I hadn't seen that degenerate mail since last night. Me either. Himiko added. Plus, I overslept and didn't wake up until Karumi came to tell us about the body. I was in my room as well. The dark haired girl provided. Shuichi nodded. All we know is that his body was discovered well after breakfast started. That would put us a little past 7.30. I woke up with the Monocub's announcement, so I wouldn't know who was awake or not. Me either. Kaito commented. I'm usually an early riser, but last night took a lot out of me. So, what's left for you two? Tenko wondered. Well, we were going to check out Kyo's room. Shuichi explained. Hopefully we'll get some answers there. This is getting ridiculous. Kaito lamented. The three investigators had finally grouped back up and used the key left in Karekio's pocket to enter his dorm room. However, much to their chagrin, the anthropologist's room was distinctly lacking in clues. His bed isn't made. Kaede pointed out. So that means he didn't make it before he was killed. But that can mean any number of things. <laughs> He seemed to be the meticulous type, Shuichi observed. It's likely he was in a hurry and had to let it slide. Still, there's nothing here to tell us when he died, Kaede reminded him. How are we going to figure that out? That's not even the worst part, Kaito complained. I've looked in every drawer in this damn room and I can't find his motive video anywhere. So much for Maki's idea, Kaede sighed. So, Maki gave you an idea that was a waste of time, hmm? The three turned and saw Kokichi standing in the doorway. What the hell do you want? Kaito spat. <laughs> the dictator chuckled. Just checking in. I'm guessing you guys are having trouble. We need to hold your hands again. Kaede grit her teeth. She was mad at Kokichi, sure. But he had a point. Last trial, he was invaluable to their success. And now. He was aware of a possibly vital piece of information. Kokichi? She began. Do you remember what was on Kyo's video? Oh? Kokichi replied. Could it be that Kaede wants my help after all? If you would. Kaede begrudgingly requested. Kokichi pondered this. Mm. Nah, save for the trial. It'd be more fun that way. Kokichi! Kaede protested. What now? Shuichi cut in. You were in the dorms all morning for your safety, right? Yeah. He answered, seemingly bored. Did you see or hear anything weird before the body discovery announcement? Kokichi scratched at his temple, as though he was shuffling through a loose collection of memories. I heard a lot of footsteps. He recalled. The early set was around 6 a.m. But I only woke up at 5.45 a.m., so there could have been any amount, really. Wakes up that early. Kaede wondered. Now might not be the time to worry about that. Kokichi commented. And as if on cue. Monokuma once again appeared on the monitors. Alright, everybody! Enough playing around now! It's high time we got to what everyone's been waiting for! Head to the Shrine of Judgment by the Fountain so we can start the class trial! Seriously? Kaede complained. See you there! Kokichi sang, waving goodbye. He left the room with a spring in his step. Shit. Kaito swore. We've got next to nothing. We'll have to make do. Shuichi sighed. Let's go. The Shrine of Judgment was a sight to behold. So too were the baker's dozen of students that surrounded it. Kokichi stood around with a snide smile, indulging in the dirty looks the others shot at him. Tenko kept Himiko close for comfort, though for whom was a good question. Angie was leading Gonta in a bit of prayer, 
much to Kibo's fascination. Others, like Maki and Ryoma, kept to themselves. Kaede and her two allies stood firm as the water parted. Looks like it's that time, she announced. Mew, off to the side, scoffed. We better not F this up. Let's just get sour with. Tenko declared. I missed my morning run for this. Himiko blinked and then simply just yawned. Atua is with us and will guide us, Angie decreed. Going to acknowledge this with an Amen. Kibo nodded his head and also said, Amen. As the elevator door opened before the students, the group made their way into the rickety old transport. Once the last student entered, the door closed with a sickening thud. And they once again began their descent. Shuichi? Kaede said, asking for her friend. Hmm? We can do this, right? I... I think so. Right. Just needed to hear someone else say it. Kaede reassured. With the sound of a bell, the door opened, once again revealing the trial ground. The students filed out to get their individual podiums. This isn't like the last time, Kaede thought to herself. There's no mastermind among us. No boogeyman to take the blame away. Kia was my friend, and one of my other friends killed him. And I need to find out who. This is what it all comes down to. The battle between truth and lies. The battle between faith and doubt. The battle between life and death. This is the class trial. <laughs>